My name is Associate Professor Scott Optic, and if you don't know who I am, I'm here at the Auckland University Faculty of Law. Uh, welcome to a dialogue uh, on the future of the TPP and what now for New Zealand. Uh, this is an event uh, hosted and sponsored by the Legal Research Foundation in uh, cooperation with the uh, University of Auckland Faculty of Law. Uh, we have two participants uh, today, uh, our own Professor Jane Kelsey from the University of Auckland Law School. Uh, as it says on the uh, flyer for this event, Jane is certainly one of New Zealand's best known critical commentators on issues related to globalization and neoliberalism. She's taught here at Auckland since 1979, specializing in socio-legal studies, law and policy, international economic regulation. She's active internationally as a researcher, analyst, advisor, media commentator on globalization, especially the TPP agreement, trade and services, and other investment agreements. She's an active member of a number of international coalitions of academics, trade unionists, NGOs, and social movements, and a world traveler working for social justice. Our visitor today, Professor Raj Bala, um, one of my dearest friends for 35 years from the University of Kansas School of Law. He is the Legal Research Foundation Distinguished Visiting Fellow for 2017. Uh, Raj is the Associate Dean for International and Comparative Law and the Rice Distinguished Professor at the University of Kansas School of Law in the United States. He practiced at the Federal Reserve Bank in New York City, where he twice won the President's Award for Excellence, thanks to his service as a delegate to the UN Conference on International Trade Law. He's a Harvard Law School graduate. He completed his master's degrees at LSC and Oxford as a Marshall Scholar and an undergraduate degree at Duke as an Andrew B. Duke Scholar. He's an author of many, many books and a leading textbook in international trade law, the first treatise on GATT in nearly 50 years, and a new book on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. He is also the first non-Muslim American scholar to write a textbook on Islamic law, and he writes the On Point monthly column for Bloomberg Quint India. This is his fourth trip to New Zealand, a country that he dearly loves. Those are the introductions. Now, remind me of the format for today. Professor Kelsey, then me. Then you. Then, for, uh, then we'll have an open dialogue. So about 15 minutes each, right? And then take it from there. All right. In that case, uh, thanks everyone for coming. We appreciate it. And we will turn you over now to Professor Jane Kelsey. Creaky old body. Oh, kia ora. Kia ora. Long time since we had our last dialogue. Um, I think it was in the, oh, was it in the Northern, Northern Club? Club. Northern. Yes. <laughs> yes, when Raj and I did a, a joint course where he very kindly allowed me to do my services bit in the real trade part, in his real trade course. Um, and it's lovely to have you back again, and I'm sorry I'm not here for more of your trip, um, but I'm sure you'll be back, maybe before I retire. Have to make it quick. And the students who I am sure have had a really stimulating time in your course, um, as well as some refugees from my old course and <laughs> some existing students. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot of detail around the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement um, because you can read that in Raj's book and I'm more interested at present in understanding the dynamics that are surrounding the TPPA and the other mega regional agreements. I've just come back from Beijing on Saturday uh, where we've been having discussions around the relationship between some of those big agreements and some of the other ones that are being negotiated within Asia. And those discussions are happening everywhere in the world now. So it's a really turbulent, vibrant and slightly scary time. Um, and so I want to paint a, a bit of a picture, some of which will, I think, coincide with some of what Raj says and some of which won't, which is what dialogue's about. Um, having spent seven years 
dealing with the turgid texts of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, um, I found it was always important to try to step back and ask, what is it that they're trying to achieve here? And as lawyers, we can sometimes get a bit lost in the details of the texts. And certainly the poor negotiators find that problem because their KPIs are actually delivering on the text. And even when they feel a bit awkward about some of what they're negotiating, they have a job to do. Our job as academics is to challenge some of what's on paper. Sometimes a bit difficult when the negotiations are secret, but helped when they leak like a sieve. In the case of the TPP, it was a partial sieve. Uh, another of the negotiations that I'm working on at present that I'll refer to shortly, the Trade and Services Agreement, everything's getting leaked all of the time. That means that we have two lots of jobs to do. Well, three lots, actually. One of them is that we have to analyse what is in the actual texts. And it's a quite technical realm that we work in. And especially in, I, I work in the non-trendy area of services and e-commerce and so on, which there's much less written about than in the old areas of, of goods and agriculture and even intellectual property. So part of our job is to analyse the text. Part of our job is also then to translate that to constituencies who need to understand what's being negotiated but don't otherwise have access to the information. But also our role as academics is then to question the broader objectives and put them in a context so people can decide whether in fact this pathway is the one that we want to follow. We all have different ways of doing that and different lenses through which we view these texts. My own is part of the reason why this agreement and several of the other mega agreements is so interesting to me. Before most of you were born, New Zealand had a major transformation right, in the 1980s. Yeah? Sometimes at the time called Rogernomics, then called neoliberalism and so on. But it changed the regulatory framework at the same time as changing the economic framework of the country. And that was shared in many other parts of the world. Right? We had it happening with Thatcher, we had it happening in Chile with Pinochet, we had it happening with Reagan in the US, and so on. And just as domestically here, the laws and the regulatory frameworks shifted to accommodate the new kind of economic model that we had, so internationally the rules started being rewritten in ways that related to the new mode of capitalism that had taken over from the Keynesian style that we had based on industrial policy inside countries and so on. So the transnationalization of capital followed later by increasing financialization, the way everyone got rich was by, by stock markets and shares and property and so on. New rules were being developed that facilitated that process. And the agreements that we started to see emerge starting with the Uruguay round negotiations that ended up with the World Trade Organization, moved from the old-fashioned commodities to a whole lot of new policy and regulatory areas, including intellectual property, services. And so we started to see an important shift occurring that complemented what was happening in the domestic arena. And that's when I started working on these agreements. What interested me about them was not, I find 
slabs of butter and motor cars and um, old-fashioned trade stuff quite boring. The more interesting stuff is what is now referred to as the behind the border disciplines on government's policy and regulation. Not tariffs at the border, but the kind of regulatory frameworks that governments were signing up to that would be binding and enforceable outside the country. And so during the Uruguay round of the GATT, we had those emerge, uh, in particular the Trade and Services Agreement. Then attempts to expand that further during the Doha round of the WTO, which got stalled, then looking to do it further and further through free trade agreements that were bilateral free trade agreements, and then trying to bring them together and push the boundaries further again through what we refer to as the mega regional agreements. And there is a consistency and an accumulation through those processes. But just as we see the economic model that emerged from the 1970s facing problems, global financial crisis being a classic example of the instabilities and implosions around deeply integrated uh, financial markets, but also the ways that the transnationalization of the economy has created winners and losers. Big winners, quite a lot of losers. Not just in the industrial belt, but for those who read Piketty's materials and and other kinds of treatises, or even listen to the speeches now from the head of the IMF or more recently even, uh, the, uh, the WTO, a recognition that we have a mode of capitalism that is not inclusive. And so it's not surprising that we see the rules that developed around that economic model also running into strife. And running into more and more strife, the more they are being pushed further and further in the direction that compounds the problems that we see. And so for those of us who followed uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement negotiations, most of the controversy, most of the issues around that was not actually about the old-fashioned commodity trade. What we heard most about in this country was dairy, but dairy actually wasn't, it was, it was one small part of this huge 30 chapter agreement. The real controversies were the intellectual property chapter and the extension of, of um, copyright and the digital locks on um, stuff you buy from offshore and then you put it in your DVD player and you can't actually read it because it says you can only read it in another part of the world. Um, Or, of course, the pharmaceuticals. Um, And so you had whole communities saying, what's a trade agreement doing telling us how we're to run run our, our libraries, how we're to run our pharmaceutical schemes? Likewise, on the investment chapter, yeah? Of course, the big issue here and other places was tobacco. How can you have companies like Philip Morris suing a government over introducing plain packaging tobacco under the investment chapters of these agreements? Where, Where did they get those rights from? Or other parts of the agreement for those of us who were working on financial regulation, why were they deepening the problems that brought us the financial crisis? Why are they disarming governments' abilities to re-regulate the finance sector? And so there were a whole lot of very serious questions about the contradictions that were being um, perpetuated in the agreement. And this is one of the reasons why it took six years to negotiate, because these debates kept happening. What we then saw 
was a real problem being able to sell the agreement internationally. Now here we get told it was all about Trump. Well, it wasn't about Trump. The reason why it ended up being in Trump's domain was that President Obama couldn't get it through the US Congress. He needed to rely on Republicans, and the Republicans weren't going to support it, and the Democrats weren't going to have a bar of it. You know? And so it possibly may never have happened, even without Trump. But not just there. You had a whole lot of other countries. Australia's Senate, which the Liberal government doesn't control, they didn't want to support it. In Vietnam, the Vietnamese government decided that they weren't that certain about it and didn't put it up for a vote until they'd seen what was going to happen with Obama. And you had a whole variety of problems across these countries. And it was about the domestic issues that the agreement raised. So not only was it not just about Trump, it wasn't just about old-fashioned trade. It was about particular models. And if you look at problems elsewhere, you see that it's not just about the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement or the TTIP, the EU-US one that's also fallen over. Brexit was, for all of its weirdness, the same as the US election, um, was about people feeling alienated from being able to control the rules that would govern their lives by a politburo called the European Commission uh, in Brussels. You had the issues in Greece. You had, in the work I'm doing at present, a number of countries withdrawing from bilateral investment treaties and developing their own alternatives. South Africa, because it had a case challenging post-apartheid um, redistributions. Brazil, developing a quite different model. India, because it's facing, amongst other things, challenges to termination of telecoms licenses that were corruptly um, issued. And, and so we're seeing a whole lot of these eruptions in different places. And we need to get away from simply seeing this as being uh, an issue about Trump and the TPP to see that it's actually a contest over the rules and the paradigms that are going to govern international economic law and domestic regimes in the future. Now, I just want to make a couple of, of other points, keeping an eye on the clock. One is that there is a sense of what in the old days we used to call Tina. There is no alternative, that this is a one-way track that just, you, you, you can't have anything different. It's unthinkable to have anything different. Well, actually, historically, there are paradigm shifts that always occur. And they tend to be about three or four decades long. And then you have a kind of implosion of the contradictions of that model and a new model is born out of it. We had that after um, the laissez-faire era in the 1910s, 20s, and the Depression in the 30s that gave birth to a whole new economic regime and set of economic rules that became the GATT that balanced the national and the international. We had it in the 1970s with, again, a shift in the economic model as well as a shift in the rules through the birth of the WTO. We're now seeing what... Um, Carl Polanyi called the beginnings of another great transformation, or what Antonio Gramsci called the interregnum. The old is dying, the new is yet to be born, we don't know what it's going to look like, but it, there are lots of morbid symptoms around. And those who want desperately to hold on to what is there now are trying to turn back that tied. So when we saw recently the moves uh, in Hanoi by our Minister of Trade to say the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement can be rescued and we don't need to make any changes to it 
And everyone's agreed that we can do it by the end of the year. Well, hopefully you'll read in the Herald a column in a few days that explains why that's not the case. Um, not only are we implementing the agreement without the US actually having to do anything in return, so why on earth would the US want to return to the fold when its corporations are already getting what they want without any price? And if they did return to the fold, they would have a long list of additional things that they want us to give. But also the other countries themselves are saying this needs to be renegotiated. The deal was done with the US. The US isn't there anymore. We made concessions. We're not going to keep those concessions if we're not getting the trade-offs. And as Bill English acknowledged the other day, you reopen the text, the TPP won't happen. Why then are they so desperate to rescue it? This is my closing couple of points. The first is short-term domestic political expediency. Huh? Rather than saying, oh, we've invested so much for the last X number of years in this and it's come to nothing, we are now having the spin to say it will all be right. And then that the opposition parties who are gainsaying that are anti-trade and anti-corporate. So part of it is that we have an election in several months' time, and it's the short-term play, knowing that the outcome will actually be several years beyond here, if ever. But the second reason is that they can see a model in which they have invested for three decades falling over. The trade and services agreement negotiations that I work on in Geneva are now suspended and may never resume. The EU-US one, no one knows what's happening. The Canada-EU one, there's just been a decision of the European Court of Justice that says that every member state in the EU will get a chance to vote on it because of the investment rules. These mega agreements are deeply problematic. Even the one with China that is supposed to be the alternative is going very, very slowly. That's why he has to flick the switch. And it's not going to look anything like the gold standard that they claim the TPP is. And so, ironically, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, the zombie TPP, is actually the best shot they've got to resurrect these rules. The same chapters we're seeing across all of those agreements, especially the new ones on electronic commerce, on state-owned enterprises, on data localization, and so on, even now trying to put it back into the WTO with huge resistance. So we're seeing this quite desperate attempt to keep what they call the bicycle moving forward. But my sense is that the bicycle not only has two very flat tires, but it's heading over a little cliff. Our challenge is to work out what's the next lot of rules that rebalance in ways that are constructive for the international arena, but also reconstructive for some of the harm that's been done in the last three decades. Over to Raj. Right, sure. No, never. <laughs> this is one of the shorter ones. <laughs> Coming back to the University of Auckland, um, and now my fourth trip to New Zealand, it's coming back to an institution that teaches the teachers. So I'm a teacher. But this institution and two individuals in particular at it have taught me. Professor Scott Optican, as you may know, 
was my tutor and teaching assistant in law school. And he taught me a lot about legal writing, including writing briefs. And those of you in the international trade law class um, that we just concluded a, about an hour ago know about a lot of graphs and charts. And Professor Oppikin was the first one who told me that I couldn't put a graph in a brief. Um, and so I became a trade lawyer, not a litigator like him. Um, and you also read in the trade class the chapters on GATS um, in volume one of the textbook. Those chapters are directly from the lecture notes from Professor Jane Kelsey that I took in 2003. She taught me a lot about trade and services and she's acknowledged in that book very um, graciously. And furthermore, she has taught me a lot about how to look at trade issues from a different perspective. When she mentioned Rogernomics and Reaganomics and Thatcher, the Thatcher Revolution, that's the economic paradigm in which I was educated. So when I first started looking at trade rules, that's the lens through which I looked at. And you'll notice last um, Wednesday in class, we started with that Ricardo Smith paradigm. We went through very carefully the analysis of economic, um, uh, economic comparative advantage and absolute advantage. But you'll notice it didn't stop there. We then critiqued the Ricardo Smith model, went through its 20 controversial assumptions, and then went to Marxist-Leninist theory and dependency theory. All of that is thanks to a broader perspective that I was exposed to with Professor Kel Kelsey. So this is very much a place that teaches the teachers. And one of the ways I can try and give back, aside from saying a few words about TPP, is as I promised to the class, that's you middle lot in there, that I had a gift for you. So after class, you get to come and pick up your free copy that the publisher arranged of this book. We have just enough copies, I won't stack them all up now. And you will see, if you look in this book, at the index, at page 452, you go down to K and you'll see, oh wow, Kelsey, Jane, pages 35 and 266. And Jane Kelsey, is her scholarship is indeed mentioned at those pages, and you'll see it talks about some issues she's already touched on. And that is first on trade and labor rights um, issues in TPP. And you'll, you'll see that she cited at 35 as the renowned scholar, Professor Jane Kelsey of the University of Auckland. And at page 266, you'll see her work concerning state-owned enterprises and privatization is cited and quoted um, and um, here she's uh, mentioned uh, again very favorably as a prominent critic of TPP. And it was just a delight to write, putting those little adjectives um, to say thanks. Um, so don't leave without taking your copy and um, I suggest getting her autograph on it. Um, so, <laughs> all right, so that's a little bit of introduction and thanks to, to both of you. Um, now, let me say a little bit about TPP, and please uh, uh, accept my apologies for doing a little bit of reading and having to check back. Um, uh, hopefully that'll facilitate the discussion later. Comprised of 240 lines, Act 4, Scene 3 of Macbeth is the longest scene of that Shakespearean tragedy. The stage is static, because the discussion is about what the past teaches the characters for their future conduct. What action should they take given what has happened thus far? Macduff has fled from Scotland to England where he meets Malcolm, the son of the victim of regicide, Duncan. The past is colored black by Macbeth's murderous tyranny. Not only did Macbeth have Duncan murdered, but also Flance, the son of Banquo, plus all of Macduff's family. 
Does this past mean that Macduff should grieve indefinitely and be passive? Or, as Malcolm successfully argues, does the past mean that grief should be turned to revenge? TPP is the longest FTA in human history, consisting of a core text of 30 chapters plus 63 annexes, 61 side letters. TPP spans 6,000 pages. It's far easier and more pleasing to read Act 4, Scene 3 of Macbeth, or even all of Shakespeare's longest play, Hamlet, than to read just the core text of TPP. And that's true, of course, for Shakespeare's poetry. Shakespeare wrote 154 sonnets. And the core text, in contrast to just 154 sonnets, the core text of TPP is about 800 pages. No stylistic elegance, no trade rule restricted to 14 lines with a rhyme scheme, no quatrains, no final couplet in iambic pentameter. And unlike the sonnets, you don't get themes usually of love, beauty, or even truth. That's not usually a concern in some of these provisions in TPP. Now, the stylistic contrast between Macbeth and TPP is true even if you have a different subjective disposition to trade English. Contemporary trade English, since GAD, has some really odd words and acronyms. Contrary to the popular belief, Shakespeare invented about 1,700 words in English, and all of the words, almost all, 90, 95%, are still used in the English language and even still used in the form today. Open any page of TPP and you are going to be confronted with an acronym you never heard of, a term that you never saw before, and you'll say, let's pick up Shakespeare. Now, linguistics aside, in terms of the difference and the length, there is a crucial um, substantive similarity. The debate about what the terms of TPP are or are not, or what TPP should or should not contain, or whether TPP should or should not be approved, that's a debate about the meaning of the past for the future, just like Act 4, Scene 3 of Macbeth. What does NAFTA, what do the post-NAFTA FTAs, what do the Uruguay Round Agreements teach families around the world about trade liberalization? That's being asked from Kansas City to KL, from Bombay to Bordeaux, from Rio to Riyadh. And the dominant voice when families and friends and individuals all sit down, get together and talk at their kitchen tables or in the bars or wherever they speak, the dominant voice in most of this discourse is that akin to Malcolm. People, turn your grief over the adjustment costs from prior trade liberalization into revenge. Fight TPP, oppose free trade. Now, this book does not take that extreme of view, but nor does it aggressively champion TPP. Neither does it take the view that all the past omens from pay, past trade deals are bad and, and develop an opposition to trade liberalization. Macbeth made those mistakes when he drew the wrong inferences from the three witches and you get the worst outcome in a tragedy, everybody dies. On the other hand, it doesn't take the view that TPP is, is perfect, far from it. It's a remarkable FTA. All of its provisions were secret and we had a little chat in class about WikiLeaks. Um, and it was finalized 
on the 5th of October, uh, 2015. The text was not published until the 5th of November, 2015. And final, the text actually was cleaned up and published in February of 2016. Even with the passage since then, that's a lot to absorb, 6,000 pages. Now, people need some sort of sense of what do you think about the deal? And we're all familiar in law schools with grades. So here's the thesis. TPP merits a preliminary grade of a B. And the B is an evenly weighted average of a C on economics and an A on national security. 50-50. And the importance of the latter grade should not be underestimated. The connection between trade and national security has not been given enough attention, especially and most surprising maybe in the US um, Academy. And here too there's an analogy with Shakespeare. The acts and scenes in Macbeth take place in Scotland, except for Act 4, Scene 3. That's in England. And on either side of the border, Scottish and English, at a macro level, the play is about more than just the future well-being economically of Scotland. It's the security of the Scottish realm at stake and whether there should be foreign intervention from England to advance that security. So much of the drama that's surrounding TPP that occurs in America is also occurring in the other 11 parties, but not all of it. And much of the drama includes economics and national security uh, both. Now, I'll say a few words about why the C on economics and the A on national security. The C on economics comes from a number of provisions in TPP, some of which Professor Kelsey already referred to. But let's start with one of the perhaps most obvious ones, and that is, is this really about free trade? Is this deal really about liberalizing trade immediately and unconditionally? And those of you know from our class, we use the acronym DF. QF, EIF, another one of those things that sound more like a rhyme scheme in Shakespeare, but it's actually a trade term. Duty free, quota free, immediately upon entry into force. As we heard over and over again from American officials in the previous administration, TPP will reduce immediately, well, it didn't say immediately, reduce trade barriers cut tariffs in particular on 18,000 products. Is that really true? Well, yes and no. If you actually look at the tariff schedules that are attached to TPP, you will see that only about 83%, 82.85 to be exact, of the itemized lines, tariff lines, get DF, QF, EIF treatment. All of the rest are put in a staging category. So for example, New Zealand has three staging categories covering 359 products. Japan, 59 staging categories with 1,203 products. Vietnam, 35 staging categories with 3,106 products. And the staging categories vary in length of time from as short as two to five years to as long as 20 years, ballpark, 20 years. That means we don't get full implementation of DFQF for a good 20 years on all 100% of the tariff lines. And the other trick about staging categories is, are the phase outs front end loaded, back end loaded, or equally weighted? Is a tariff of say 100% coming down across 20 years, 
in equal lots of five percentage points a year? Or are you doing 10 now and 90 in year 19 or vice versa? Well, as you can imagine, when you look at the staging categories, we see plenty of back end loading. That is keeping the, the, the liberalization to later. So to call this a free trade agreement is a misnomer. It is a deal about managed trade, even in the most conventional sectors, the agricultural and industrial product sectors. It's about managed trade. And one of the problems, which again, American politicians fell into the same trap as they did with NAFTA, is they oversold the deal to the public. They sold the public on the idea that this was about free trade, cutting these 18,000 tariffs overnight, and we'll experience all the Ricardo Smith's gains from trade. And that's not the reality of the deal. And I might say when they came to Kansas City, the U.S. trade representative in particular, when they came to Kansas City to try and sell the deal, and I was a moderator of the panel, they came with two deficiencies, let me put it politely. One was they really didn't know their audience. They came from inside the Beltway, read their press release bullet points on cutting 18,000 tariffs, and had no clue what the actual interests were at stake on the Missouri or the Kansas City side of the border. Whether they, they even knew about state line road dividing the border was unclear. And they also came unable, ill-prepared, to sell the deal with effective points. I had to give them points to sell the deal. I said, for example, did you realize that Vietnam is in this deal? And that Vietnam is a country with which, with which we once fought a horrific war. And many of them in this audience are Vietnam veterans. And some of the brutalities were just as brutal as we're seeing with ISIS in Syria. And now there's a 90 million strong market of young people. And guess what? Something we make in the Kansas City area? Motorcycles. Take a look at roads around Hanoi. 40, 45% of them are not paved or poorly paved and very bumpy. They certainly cannot accommodate cars made and certainly not made in the US. What do Vietnamese young middle class, rising middle class people want? Motorcycles. What does TPP do? Bring down the tariffs on motorcycles. What a nice story. This is a country we used to bomb mercilessly we used to have POW MIA issues with, and now we could export motorcycles. They didn't even know to sell the deal properly like that, right? So uh, they either oversell it, 18,000 tariff cuts, or they undersell it by not telling the key stories in the localities. Small wonder why some of the major issues or some of the, what ought to maybe perhaps not be such major issues, depending on your view, actually envelop and sink the deal in Congress. Some of them, Professor Kelsey mentioned already, data exclusivity extending from 20 years to 37 years, patent protection on biologics. Whether there's a case to be made or not, I'm not sure, I'm not the IP expert, but that case was, was made in the hands of Senator Orrin Hatch saying, absolutely not, if it's not 12 years, it's not good enough for the US. And the deal in TPP is five years plus three years of market conditions, as you'll see um, if you read through the, the, the details. And those kinds of special interest exceptions actually worked well to, 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 to torpedo the deal in Congress rather than getting a sense of the broader good, the broader mosaic of how this thing might actually benefit the US economy. And the Kansas City Star published a story with data from credible sources on where do campaign contributions go to individual congresspersons. Number two on the list, and I'm not trying to be ad hominem, these are just facts, Senator Hatch. So the positions of many of the Congress people are absolutely, I can't say linked, that'd be false accusation, but absolutely somehow 
connected, associated, I don't know what the right word is, um, you have to look at the, the who's funding whom, right? Again, without making any accusation about what's dictating positions. Um, and we saw this pattern in, in, a, in a number of cases. And, and with the waning of the Obama administration and the rising rhetoric that started um, with the presidential debates in December, January, December 15, uh, January 2016, it was pretty clear TPP was not going to get through Congress. Um, now that's a bit on the economics. What might have been at least a halfway decent argument for common good and seeing how it, special interests really sunk the deal from the U.S. perspective, that's enough easily, along with managed trade, to give it a C. Now, many critics, and I would definitely accept the, the criticism, say, why'd you give it a C? Why not an F? Um, why not a D? It could be even lower on economics. And that's a fair enough uh, critique of the book. What about national security? Why an A? Why an A? We just discussed in class um, earlier uh, today uh, and a little bit yesterday, the trade national security nexus. TPP, from the American national security perspective, is about containing China, containing the Communist Party's uh, rise uh, across the Asia Pacific region, um, conta containing China as run by the, the Communist Party. And what do I mean by that? Well, geographically, everybody should be familiar with the nine dashed line. The nine dashed line are claims that the Communist Party has to about 90% of the South China Sea, through which 50% of world trade passes. Some of those claims are, have already been put paid by the Permanent Court of Arbitration in July of 2016, when it ruled entirely in favor of the Philippines. And if you look at some of the literature under the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, some of the claims truly are, can, are, are um, questionable, like creating an island that wouldn't normally be there and could not normally be inhabited, and then claiming it as a basis to have territory and a zone around it. That's not um, permitted under the Law of the Sea. It's not just the U.S. that's at interests are at stake here. It's all the other claimants to freedom of navigation and sovereignty. So the idea of across the, the South China Sea. So TPP was stitched together with Vietnam, Malaysia, Philippines, Brunei, several of the countries, Japan, that have interests in the island disputes. Initially, the Obama administration didn't want to use the word containment. It is a provocative term. It does date back from the Cold War. And least of all me wants to bring back memories of the Cold War or be provocative with respect to China or the party. The best is a strategic partnership, not, not um, uh, conflict, obviously. So I don't mean to be provocative about that. But there, and in fact, TPP was specifically drafted by the American team to exclude China from the negotiations so that the U.S. and its 11 partners could write the rules, like on state-owned enterprises, and then invite China in, not exclude China later on if China wanted to come in. So it was never designed to forever exclude China but it was designed to create a rules-based system in Asia Pacific, see how things go over the nine dash line, and maybe China might come in. It's not a surprise then that four American secretaries of state and eight secretaries of defense, or I might, got that, might have inverted that, four secretaries of defense and eight secretaries of state endorsed TPP. One of them even said, TPP is worth an aircraft carrier to me. Now we have 10 aircraft carriers in our fleet, one is coming on board, that's pretty significant. So when we look at TPP, we wanna look at it not only as an economic creature and not only from the perspectives of free trade, managed trade, and all of the points that Professor Kelsey uh, correctly mentioned about effects on local people, whether it's, not, whether it's the right model of liberalization, why is it going into issues like data exclusivity, 
Why aren't we leaving that up to the countries? But we also need to see it as a national security device. Now, as you know, famously, um, the current president withdrew from TPP as one of his first acts. Um, that decision by the president has been reiterated as final by the U.S. Trade Representative um, Robert Lighthizer and um, in, by other officials in other venues. So if they stick to their word, what they will do is renegotiate NAFTA with Canada and Mexico, maybe try a bilateral deal with Japan, continue perhaps the other FTAs that we have bilaterally with TPP partners like Korea, Singapore, and then who knows what the US trade policy will be with respect to New Zealand. My own view for what it's worth, that is a waste of time and a waste of taxpayer money and a waste of resources to have the US trade representative renegotiating NAFTA, rethinking the bilaterals. Hey, we just spent eight years doing that. It's called TPP. If you want, if you have a problem with TPP or our partners in New Zealand have a part, problem with TPP, let's look at it together, the 12 of us. That doesn't seem to be where things are headed. And, um, you know, as the title of the uh, um, talk says, um, we'll, we'll have to just wait and see about what the future holds. Don't forget your book before this is over. I'm not carrying them back. I come up and Absolutely. Some question and answer. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Cool. Well, thanks for that. That was absolutely two fascinating perspectives on this and absolutely right on topic. So um, this is just to be clear, this is also this uh, this dialogue also serves as the last hour and a half of Raj's class on international <laughs> right, yeah. on international trade law, because not only was Raj the, uh, the LRF uh, distinguished as any fellow, but he was also teaching a class for us in the master's program in international trade law. The second time that he's taught here, the first time was with Jane. Um, so that's terrific, uh, and I'm sure that raises a lot of issues. We've got about a half an hour, which is a long time. So I'd invite anybody in the audience, James Firmer students, Raj's students, or anyone else who's here, to ask any questions, and we'll get some dialogue going, which is uh, the point of this talk. So who would like to make a comment or ask a question to get things going? Don't be shy. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, question for you, Raj, but I'm sure James. I might repeat it just for the uh, just for the audio. Yeah. Um, when you said an aid for national security, I thought maybe you meant sovereignty, um, which has probably you know been the um, key sort of lightning rod here is around the impact of TPPA like agreements on the ability of countries to regulate or re-regulate. Um, do you have, uh, was that part of your sort of A assessment on national security, um, the issue of, you know, the democratic security of the nation, and if not, why not? It was part of the uh, economic evaluation, not the national security evaluation. Um, it's a great question. Um, the, um, yeah, sure. the book Just tries to define up. criteria. Um, for assessing on an economic sense and a national security sense and why to give a C versus an A. And um, the um, problem um, that you've identified is what the book talks about in, in the sense of this deal reinforces plutocratic oligar um, oligopolistic interests. To be, and it goes through from ancient Greece what's the definition of plutocracy? And then from economics, what are oligopolies? And then what are some of the specific provisions in TPP where you see um, plutocracies and the rules that they favor that reinforce the oligopolies that they control? Um, uh, what do you, where do you see some of those rules um, in TPP? Um, the national security dimension was, was a more traditionally military interests. Um, that is, 
um, the, 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 the issues of sovereignty in the sense of the islands and freedom of navigation. Um, and underlying those interests of value systems between the, 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 the parties involved, what, what the, the values the Communist Party is proposing um, across its people and to Asia, and what the values traditionally um, the US, New Zealand, Australia, some of the other countries have shared. Um, so uh, the answer is yes, but in the other realm. Um, now that, the problem with that answer is it kind of does stretch the definition of economic evaluation. You could say, well, how come you're including, are you saying democracy is part of the economic calculation? That wouldn't be the traditional neoclassical approach, you know, the Chicago school approach, but in a more um, broad-minded and liberal sense, it, it would be. But it also conflates values to exclude the value of democratic control. So, I, I mean, I question the extent to which any reference to values really does come within that conception of national security. So, okay, so to be less vague, the values I'm thinking about are um, uh, what what does the party stand for in terms of um, individual rights and freedoms that the U.S. military has traditionally safeguarded after the Second World War throughout the Asia Pacific? Like in Vietnam. Like in Vietnam. I think there's a different, we have a different framework of, of looking at some of this and, and some of what I've been doing recently on, on the mega deals, there's, there's the geopolitics argument, right? which is the, the kind of national security, uh, whose rules are going to govern the world. Um, there is a strategic set of arguments which are different countries have different reasons for doing what they're doing. And then there is a political economy argument. And, and I think where we have a difference, for me, the political economy issues are what then raises the questions of where is power held in an economic and a social and political sense, which is where I see the instabilities happening. So I think we, we have a different um, uh, approach to that. And, it was in, when I was in China last week, it was when the One Belt, One Road uh, summit was on. Mm. You know? And the discussions were really interesting because on the one hand, we're familiar with the TPPA and TISA and, and, and TTIP arguments, which are, because of course China was excluded from, from, yeah. from TISA as well, you know, who's going to make the rules in, in terms of what interests. And the Chinese were describing that as the old Bretton Woods model. Right? Whereas the One Belt, One Road initiative was depicted as being pro-development, pro-SMEs, <laughs> not the... Um, uh, not the elite of the corporate beneficiaries, but the One Belt, One Road actually looking at how you integrate for the benefit of developing countries through this different model. Right. And, and so you've got this set of rules and strategies that are attached to these quite different approaches. And, and my concern, going back to political economy, is that... The One Belt, One Road initiative is based also on a highly digitized economy, which is the same as we're seeing now through um, the e-commerce parts of TPP and TISA and the WTO proposals, both of which are premised on the notion of constant disruption, creative destruction, instabilities, constant remaking, and both of the models seem to me to carry that problem of instability, insecurity, automation leading to job losses, and so on. And so there's a political economy problem with both of the models. Um, you've got the geopolitical layer, you've got the strategic interest there, but there's actually a, a fundamental shared problem with the China approach and the U.S. approach. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. And just to pick up on that a little bit, um, the Chinese are selling One Belt, One Road 
as a pro-development. But a different way of looking at it is that, is that, as you may be suggesting is, this is about taking care of bloated state-owned enterprises controlled by Communist Party oligarchs in China in steel or aluminum or you name it. Because who's steel, aluminum, etc., is going to be used on the one belt, one road? And it's easy to be exploitative because where else is Pakistan going to turn, right? Um, so there, this is, you have to look through the um, uh, labels and ask who's really benefiting from the deal. And if I could just add, another, given that we're doing a, a dialogue, two other elements to that. One is that it's not just the SOEs in China, it's Jack Ma and Alibaba who are the equivalent of GAFA, Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple, right? And both of them are looking at controlling the digital platforms, which others will be supplicants to. Yeah? Um, and so you've got, the, and, and heavily financialized in the, in the China yes. side yes. of things as well. And the second is that we're now seeing internationally China pushing bilateral investment treaties and investment chapters in FTAs that are exactly the TPPA model. Huh? And they're trying to push it in the WTO now for the Buenos Aires Ministerial in December in the name of um, trade facilitation and investment. Yeah? And so China is trying to use exactly the same legal tools to protect its offshore investments against the kinds of backlashes that the um, US, EU, Japan, and others have also used them for. Can I ask a question? I mean, I, this is not my area of law, but I, two things just struck me, one on the security issue, one on the, uh, the interest, special interest issue. Um, so in my area of law, which is criminal law, when people choose juries in the United States, I mean, nobody thinks that the prosecution and defense wants to choose a fair jury. They want to choose a jury that's favorable to them. And the idea is that in the contest of strikes and peremptories and challenges for cause, something approximately, you know, it's sort of the approximate equivalence of a fair jury kind of comes out. So when I hear the two of you talk, I, it, it strikes me that it never occurred to me that trade agreements were any were, were really all about the common good. It strikes me that the basic notion of any agreement, any sort of contract between parties, is trying to argue their own interests. And it's no surprise to me that countries want to argue their own interests and fight for their own interests. And if those interests are the interests of their corporate donors or the interests of their labor unions or the interests of whatever they see it, uh, you know, they will do that. Now, there's an issue, of course, is who gets to capture the interest market, right? I mean, whose voice is the loudest? But the idea that countries are negotiating, you know, for themselves doesn't strike me as, as, as so unusual. But maybe it's the difference between a, a sort of a... A, a trade agreement that's based on notions of common good or a trade agreement just based on individual notions of particular goods from which some rough approximation that we can all live with comes out. So I guess I'm wondering, it sounds like you're both critiquing that in one, one way or another, but why is it actually surprising? How could it be any other way? That's my first question. Well, I mean, tra trade agreements need not be about the common good, and as you correctly suggest, it's not surprising when countries approach it from a completely self-interested perspective and try and extract the maximum amount of concessions from the other side and give the minimum amount reciprocally. In fact, traditionally, trade negotiations are conducted on the basis of reciprocity. But it's long been understood in the GATT since 1947 that at the end, when we all sit down and we look at a text, we agree on it as part of what's called a single undertaking, that we're all going to move forward with no uh, uh, country objecting, because we all believe there's enough in it for us that it's worth moving forward. And we also benefit from being in the system. We benefit from mutually from the, from the rising prosperity and hopefully um, uh, poverty alleviation that the deal is bringing about. Now that hasn't always happened, certainly not the poverty alleviation as we know across the last 20 or 30 years, but there has been a sense of we're all collectively in it together. And in fact, when we come to the area of dispute settlement, I'll put all your comment about jury trials, um, uh, the reason that in most cases, not all, 
um, that we get compliance with WTO adjudicatory outcomes by the losing parties because they know they're repeat players in the system. Um, doesn't always work, but generally they say, well, I lost this time. All right, I'll comply. It may take time. You know, maybe I'll drag my feet, um, but I'll comply because next time I'm going to be on the other side. So um, I, the, the, there's been this underlying common good enemy. Now, it's not called that. That actually comes, the term common good comes from a principle of social justice theory. Um, and I think that one of the problems, which I, uh, in, in, in that terminology, which I think um, um, Professor Kelsey absolutely rightly mentioned starting off was um, we've lost this shared sense. Um, the public that looks at the trade agreements and the officials who negotiate it and the legislators who have to pass it of what's in it for all of us. And in fact, I remember being told, um, and we probably all heard this repeatedly, that um, Congress people and senators will not sit down and read all 6,000 pages or even the 800 pages of core text. And they may give a couple of staff members the time to do that, maybe. Um, but what they'll do is what we call guerrilla raid missions into the text. You look for just that interest, uh, just that provision that um, you care about based on your interest groups in your constituency that you represent or that fund you from out of state. And just to finish the point, it's really, really important for uh, everyone to understand and, and actually Professor Opton is a better expert at this, the effect on U.S. politics, including trade politics, of the Supreme Court decision in Citizens United, which allows for unlimited campaign contributions to political action committees. Pick your, pick your um, uh, lobbying group. They can fund candidates' PA PACs to an unlimited degree. And while hypothetically there's not supposed to be any link between the PAC and the candidate. I think we know what the reality sometimes is. And that is worrisome because it can really make getting a sense of the common good and trade deals um, uh, you know, uh, through Congress. Yeah, I would say it's almost even simpler. You got someone like Donald Trump just saying, America first. <laughs> I mean, that's just an explicit rejection of the notion of any underlying basis of common good in a free trade agreement. Anyway, Jack, I'm, I'm not sure that common good actually. I, I'm I'm much more of a cynic. Um, yeah, well, that's kind of uh, what I was and, thinking. Yeah, <laughs> too, I guess. But but yeah, uh, Tony Angi, when he he was out here some time ago, um, uh, did um, did the master's trade course as well. And you know, from, from his perspective, the asymmetry of rulemaking uh, in the international economic law arena, uh, that is a form of legal imperialism of who made the rules and then who built on the premises and the underlying rules that were developed through the colonial and, and imperial era that then formed the base of the GATT and how many countries were in the GATT originally, yeah. Um, 23. And then, you know, and, and part of the problem with the WTO now is there's, damn, there's all these developing countries in there, you know, who aren't letting us have the rules we want, so we go off and we make our own rules in our own arena. Very asymmetrical. There were US FTAs based on a model agreement. Yeah? What's the room for negotiation? You negotiate around the edges. Um, and and so, you know, I, I, it, it's even when you've got a criminal trial, you've got a question of how equal are the parties. But when you look at the Trans Pacific Partnership Agreement, even when Japan came in, it, it was the US plus 11. Yeah? Um, because there was no negotiation around certain things. Well, the Aussies were tough on beef. <laughs> he was a hot tie. <laughs> um, and Japan but, really was tough on rice. <laughs> but, but, yeah, but they had how many sacred products That's that came five. out of rice? Yes. Okay. Um, but, but what we're seeing now, and this is, I think, what is the most important rulemaking development at present, is the attempts to, even if TPP is dead, to make it live 
through other agreements. So making it normative, and it's even it's being called organ harvesting. Um, and in the text that we've got in the WTO now for the ministerial in, in December, yeah, it's the same text in RCEP. Yeah? We're seeing Japan and Korea and Australia and New Zealand tabling the TPP text there. But you've got China, you've got India, and you've got ASEAN that operates by consensus. Yeah? So there you've got a bit of your courtroom contest. Yeah? Back in the WTO, you've now got, you know, the developing countries are not themselves united. Yeah? The bricks are all over the blooming place. Um, and so it's South Africa, it's the Africa group, it's the LDCs um, that are the ones who are trying to resist that expansion of the agenda, those normative rules in the WTO um, uh, at, at the ministerial. And, and so you know, it is, it's an institutional power politics game about whose rules will reflect not just the individual corporate interests, but as I said, sort of what's the model of capitalism that's operating that the rules need to serve? Um, and I think we really are having, uh, we're having a contest between China's version of the right. model and the, right. and the US version of the model. And one of the, one of the interesting illustrations of, of the uh, divergence sometimes of interests among developing countries came up in the context in the TPP negotiations on rules of origin for autos and auto parts where Mexico was taking one view along with Canada and finally brought along the US, whereas Japan wanted rules of origin that protected its supply chain for autos and auto parts that um, ran through uh, Vietnam, a TPP party, and Thailand that's not a TPP party. So basically the, the Vietnamese and the Japanese wanted lower Value, uh, regional value content on autos and auto parts to qualify for origin, whereas um, Canada and the U.S. and to some degree Mexico um, wanted higher NAFTA or even perhaps higher rules of origin. So you, there was a negotiation over that all important number which we studied in class. Would it be 20 percent, 25 percent, or 62.5 and one of the interesting countries to watch, and I always tell this um, to um, officials in the Gulf, particularly in Saudi Arabia, because um, Professor Kelsey mentioned what model should we look at. So look at Mexico. Mexico is a really interesting country. You see how their trade positions have matured over the decades as they have become more and more of a developed or developed-like country, even though they've been fighting this horrific drug war. And Mexico came out with this proposal, which ended up being adopted in TPP, which is, look, let's look at the specific kinds of auto parts at stake. If it's a low value added auto part, like let's say a windshield wiper, we don't want to become, we're not going to become rich making windshield wipers. That can be done fine in Vietnam or Laos. So that can be a 25% rule of origin. But on something far more sophisticated, like um, an engine system, or maybe the audio system that has Bluetooth or wireless, that we want to do. That we're going to stake more of our development on. So Mexico has been able to see itself as it is and as it wants to be, and then take specific technical trade policy um, positions in the negotiations. That's kind of been a pretty cool thing to watch since NAFTA. And, and it's interesting because this is not something that you'll hear from you know, the current crop of American um, leadership about, well, how has this benefited common good? How has it benefited um, our partner, Mexico? And if you know much about U.S. history, that's another country with which the U.S. has often been at war at, <laughs> grabbed land from, um, and had terrible prejudicial relations with. Of course, Mexico's fat the dummy. Mexico's fat the dummy. I, I can ask my second question, or someone else can ask a question, because we've got about 10 minutes left. They, yeah, they, go ahead. Uh, they refused to. Guys, sorry. <laughs> sorry. 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 Sorry.
here. Um, you're talking about the height of the border disciplines on guns. Um, and do you think that this could be modified in future trade agreements um, mm -hmm. in order to preserve the right to regulate in the public interest? Or do you think that in order to preserve that right, or have to scrap the local natural system entirely? And let's just keep the answers a little quick, yeah. just in case. Okay. Well, well, one of the things that we're seeing increasingly um, over recent agreements is technical ways that remove future rights to regulate. I mean, whether it's negative lists in investment and services chapters or um, uh, in financial services, never regulating new financial services and products that you don't know about yet and so on. Um, in the work I've just been doing, analysing all of the dreadful TISA texts from last November, we are seeing really, really strong pressure uh, there for governments to agree that whatever commitments they make now will apply whatever new technologies exist in the future that you've never thought of. So if you think about drones and driverless trucks now and you think of, goodness me, what might the next generation of those be and we've given away the right to, to regulate them, oops! Um, and... One of the big uh, fights inside the EU on, on TESA, one of the reasons why um, it stalled late last year, was that the European Parliament has said that the Commission cannot promise never to regulate new services. And it's that fundamental question, what Lila raised about sovereignty or about you know, the ability of the right to regulate, because the right to regulate in the agreements, which is rhetorically mentioned time and again, is only the right to regulate to the extent that the rules in the agreement allow you to regulate. Yeah. And so it's a meaningless piece of, of rhetoric, um, which is trotted out as a piece of reassurance to any critics who don't have the next bit of the air ammunition to go back and say, but actually, <laughs> this is what it means. So yeah, that's um, that regulatory issue, especially with the trade and services agreement, because services is actually all about regulation. There's no, there's no pretense that it's about motor vehicles or garments or, or whatever, although increasingly it is, because they're, they're IT driven and so on. But. And it's a similar story in TPP with the services schedules. They're actually two sets of annexes, they're called non-conforming measures, and in one of the annexes, as Professor Kelsey is suggesting, the trade negotiators, if they know what they're doing and they're clever, um, and they really want to protect the right to regulate, they have to be, they have to specifically put the, the, the schedule the service sector or subsector or sub-subsector in the right annex and then list the right exceptions. And to do that requires all of you you lawyers representing different service industries have to go to MFAT or go to the USTR and say, you better preserve the right to regulate in buried in that non-conforming measure annex. And if you don't, you lose it. It's sort of the squeaky wheel gets the grease. One of the interesting things in the TISA New Zealand schedule, um, which I happen to have seen, um, is that they have tried to correct some of the errors that we pointed out in New Zealand's TPP schedule. Yeah. Um, and, and so you know, even countries that have been doing this for a long time and considered themselves well advanced on, on services, they make mistakes, let alone not having the crystal ball. Yeah. So firstly, um, I've had the pleasure of reading in Jane's undergrad class for international economic regulation. As she said, she's quite on the other end of the spectrum from Raj, and I've just completed his master's class, so it's quite cool to see you guys both talk about this stuff. Um, but really, it's I cool mean, for us having having like you know study for the both of you, and obviously doing some research for Jane and writing a paper for you now. Um, I do get the like. And I asked you this on the first day, which is what Scott just said. Inherently, you're going to negotiate as a country for the best of your interests, right? Which, which means that you're, and you talk about reciprocity and making sure that there's a common good. And Jay obviously thinks that that's, that's kind of fizzled out. You might start away with that, but that's not happening now. But what I'm trying to get to is, 
what do you, as academics, what do you think, how can you make it better, be it by tweaking what you have with the WTO and bearing in mind that it's only 15, 20 years old, or, or as perhaps what James says, is an overhaul or more of a structural change from the 30, 40 years that you usually see changes in the economy. But like, what do you do about it? How do you make it a better system so that you are actually helping the developing country, countries or the LDCs um, and like we spoke about today, the SDT treatments, the special differential treatment, which is meant to help them, but the US, for whatever reason, um, doesn't actually enforce any of it because it's got these list of products or whatever, which which is this kind of side Jane takes, and I agree with that, but how do you, so how do you, how do you make it better, or what can you do to make sure that while the economics of free trade um, are, you know, kept in play, but how do you do it like structurally? Just quick responses please because we're pushing time. <laughs> Have to be um, well, I mean, WTO is, is there. Um, um, some, of, some of us were not great fans of the non-tradey parts of, of the WTO. Um, such as the intellectual property and, 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 and the gets and so on. But um, there is improvement that could be made there if there was the political will, but there is not the political will to address some of the outstanding issues. The more interesting question from my viewpoint now is, especially with these agreements that are falling over, that, that I have a I have a three-year research project, which is options and strategies to exit agreements. And the three case studies are the investment agreements which countries are exiting and developing new models. Really interesting to talk to the governments doing that, um, which include a number of the BRICS, um, different models, um, capital controls because there is now a recognition that capital controls are legitimate policy tools and how do we extract that. And then the tobacco issues and, and ongoing issues from there about how do we remove from the domain of so-called trade agreements the regulatory issues that are important for social policy uh, reasons. And, you know, uh, the falling over of the mega deals leaves some space. And so this is where probably, although I know Raj, you've talked about putting better things into the agreements as well. It gives time to do that thinking. Uh, but the thinking has to happen because our government and some others are hell bent on trying to keep the bicycle going forward. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. I think that um it's going to be very hard in the U.S. Um, because we are maybe 20 or 30 years into this cycle of um, uh, an American model of capitalism and that doesn't really stress the common good. Um, and we're seeing the results with the population in terms of its health care and, its, and um, the social services. and. I, I think that process is going to have to play out across the U.S. at the ballot box. Um, we're, until we get a shift in thinking about um, trade and common good in the U.S., which is, I don't see that in the next, well, it could in the 2018 elections, we'll see. But it, it's more of a cultural shift, and it's a shift that takes um, leadership that we haven't seen. Um, you know, I think a second change that needs to happen is a lot more attention to poverty alleviation um, and the link that connects dots between trade, growth in per capita GDP, more equitable income distribution, and re reduction in the recruitment bases for Al Qaeda and ISIS. I think that case still isn't clear to many in, in the American public. That it's, it, while some of the leaders in 
violent extremist organizations, VEOs, might come from wealthy backgrounds like Osama bin Laden himself. The foot soldiers are marginalized and they're often poor. And that can be whether they're from Manchester or whether they're from Raqqa. And they're, I'm still perhaps naive enough to believe um, in that, what we talked about, that Cordell Hall vision, that if you can generate growth through trade and if it's the, the benefits are properly spread, and distributed, not hoarded by a plutocratic elite, that that um, you can help reduce that sense of marginalization. And I think a third uh, piece of it, and this is a shared interest, or this is a common good interest. Shared interest is on climate change. Um, one of the chapters in the textbook is, of course, on climate change, and we are now seeing we all have a shared interest in it, um, and and we're seeing a lot of trade issues. Um, come up from climate change. We just did the solar panels, solar modules case, right, with India and the U.S. today. Um, and um, there are issues of national treatment, and, and that has to be worked out. So the very phenomenon that it exists, and it is at least partly caused by humanity, has to be sort of, um, you know, I think acknowledged. Um, the bottom line, cutting across all of these points, is um, education about globalization and about trade which in the U.S., frankly, depends on where you go. I mean, if you go to good college prep high schools, um, if you go to good colleges, you get it. Um, but if you are stuck at a lot of um, very poorly funded and, or schools with diminishing funding and cutting education budgets, um, it's hard to persuade people about these, these benefits and what the opportunities are. And they see more risk um, and threat and fear, which leads to prejudice, um, then they do opportunity. So all the more reason to come here and take classes from one or both of you. <laughs> Absolutely. Unless you don't, Trump. <laughs> Listen, I think we're going to have to wrap this up um, because we said we were at the time. First of all, let me thank um, Professor Bala Raj and Professor Kelsey Jane. This is a fantastic opportunity to have two world leading experts on issues related to trade and globalization. Uh, in one room together. I hope we get to do this again. Obviously, a lot of issues going forward, so watch this space. And thank you all to the students who came. And above all, uh, this is now the official end of Rogers International Trade Law class. That is. So the last, thing to do is, your book. the last thing to do is say, please come up and get your books. And so thank you for coming. Thanks, Tim, for recording this. And, uh, you know, just conclude right there. So thank you again.